Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honored today to be joined by Gina Gorlin. Gina is a clinical psychologist who focuses on coaching founders around a concept called the builder's mindset. And that's what we're going to unpack today. And whether you're a founder or not, the concept behind the builder's mindset is going to be applicable to you in your leadership and how you approach your team, your organization, and all of the work that you do, including yourself. So without any further ado, I'm really excited to unpack this concept with Gina today. Gina, I'd love it if you would please introduce yourself to the audience and Give us a little flavor of your very interesting background, including you know, your past before you landed in this world around psychology and the builder's mindset. Sure thing. And thank you so much for having me on. So I, as you mentioned, Mick, I'm a clinical psychologist. Let's go okay, to give you some flavor. So I'm a first generation immigrant, zeroth generation immigrant, technically, because I immigrated here with my family when I was a kid, when I was seven. Uh, from the now you know, high profile Ukraine, given everything happening there. Um, no family, everyone's okay. I know people ask. Um, but that's really shaped my a lot of my approach and perspective, I would say. And then I knew I wanted to study psychology from very early on. I also wanted to be an opera singer and a violinist and a musical theater star <laughs> when I was uh, in high school. And I actually insisted on this is probably speaks to my eventual kind of perspective and approach that I just really needed to do it all. And I needed to, to rule, rule things out the hard way. So I actually did a dual degree program at a conservatory uh, and at a university, so at Tufts University and New England Conservatory, they have this five-year dual degree program where you could do two bachelor's degrees for the price of one and it'd been roughly the time of one. It was insane. I quit after a year and a half, but I needed to try. Um, then I doubled down on my real love, which is psychology. And I went to graduate school in clinical psychology, mainly because I realized that's the best way to position myself to get to still do it all. In this case, meaning to be a researcher, to be a teacher and to be a therapist, to do private practice and to be licensed and to be able to take on all kinds of roles, be very versatile, both in and out of academia. Uh, and then I really took advantage of that in my subsequent professional career when I decided to really shift my focus toward coaching and in some cases doing therapy with entrepreneurs, ambitious innovators, leaders, you know, people who are charting their own path or self-creating, as I sometimes describe it. And I've really doubled down on taking the, the learnings of clinical psychology, everything I've learned from you know, my research, from the science of behavior change, from doing lots and lots of therapy and applying it to what I see as an underserved population, though not often spoken of that way, which is you know, the group of people who are trying to break new ground, who are trying to do hard things and the reason they need psychological support is not per se because they have a mental health problem, although many do struggle with mental health problems, but that's not the distinguishing characteristic. The distinguishing characteristic is that they're trying to do something where there's no playbook because they're the ones inventing the playbook or they're disrupting you know, their industry or they're trying to design a new approach to team building or, or leadership. They're trying to create a new model, create a new template for doing whatever it is they're doing. And that's what makes it hard. And that's what brings on the anxiety and the imposter syndrome and the, you know, communicational breakdowns and all the things I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, but that the impact I can have by really partnering with such people and helping them raise their psychological ceiling, which is kind of how I think about my work, that impact in my mind, you know, is massive because then they're going to go on to impact the world in a better way, I hope, right? Than if these psychological obstacles had limited them. So that's what I'm up to now. <laughs> yeah, really good, Gina. I, I, I want to unpack two things there. The, the first one, very interesting point, and there is still some stigma out there in society. So I'd like to address one thing is a lot of people will think about a clinical psychologist as 
where someone has got mental illness or has got some kind of problem and using a resolving mindset, they're trying to resolve something from their past or even resolve something from their present. Whereas what you said was raise the psychological ceiling. So psychology is not just about resolving issues. It's about raising performance. It's about high performance. It's about addressing the art of the possible and, and going forward. So thank you for bringing that up. I think that's important to note. Then from there, yeah. I, what I'd love to know is what makes that important to you? This working with people that are breaking new ground, it's when I look at you talk about that, it seems quite important to you. What is it about it that makes it important to you? It's a great question that I could go on and on about. Um, a couple things. So I think fundamentally, they represent to me a kind of human ideal that inspires me that I personally aspire to that you know, I'm inspired by my clients every day. They're doing things that I can't even dream of doing and that, you know, I hope to someday be able to even begin to emulate. And I get to help them with that by bringing my own little bit of expertise to helping, you know, unblock certain emotional uh, confusions or <laughs> kind of helping them to get clarity on their own you know, complex decision-making process. But like they are emulated to me, like they represent humanity at its best. They are living their fullest lives. They are out there, uh, you know, breaking new ground and failing and trying again and getting back up and, you know, experimenting with different uh, ways of whether it's marketing their product, whether it's, you know, leveraging AI and and trying to like grapple with unsolved problems that, you know, the world's greatest minds are grappling with. And like, there they are, you know, kind of in the bullpen trying to figure this stuff out. Like they are living fully. And to me, I've really come to see that human ideal. I've come to see the builder, which is why I talk about the builder's mindset, like a, the person who is really taking charge of building their life their way. Like it's their distinct path, right? Like they have set things up in their life so that they are drinking that life to the least so that they're you know, like fully alive to every moment and choosing the experiences that are important to them, choosing the people they want to experience you know, those things with. And, and I feel more alive in their presence. So, you know, I know that's a bit of a fuzzy, warm and fuzzy kind of touchy feely answer, but it's a very honest one for me. Like I, that's who I want to empower because that's who I want to learn from. Oh, I love it, Gina. And there's two things I'm hearing there. First of all, a virtuous cycle, because you are enabling their success. You're helping them to do what they do. And in return, they're inspiring you back up. It's almost a yeah. perfect relationship. I just love it. I want to then Absolutely. unpack this kind of this building a little bit more. And I've got a very specific question to ask you. So, so you're talking about people, people that are building their life the way they want their life and breaking new ground. These are the terms that you keep using, which I think are wonderful. I want to know from a psychology point of view, are there, is there a certain subset of people in the world that are just wired this way? Now, bear with me for a second. We know that generally people fear change. They fear the unknown, that their fear of loss is greater than their appreciation of gain. And yet here is this subset of people that go, oh, I don't care about that. And they challenge the status quo. Well, they go, oh, supposedly okay. they don't care. Okay, tell me. <laughs> That's okay, where tell I come me. in Let's... because they care. Ah, okay. Oh, All right. Yeah. Let's unpack that. Let's go. That's so, great. So I'm glad you're asking. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. You're going to, okay. So I think I, yeah, hear your question. Maybe a two part question. One, is there a certain subset of people, like, uh, is there a personality profile for mm. which this kind of ambitious, innovative career and life is suitable? Um, and maybe then the second part of the question is what's different about them, if so, right? Or, or how do they overcome what seem to be these near universal confines that keep the rest of us scared, right? Or keep us repeating the status quo. So on the first question, yes and no. I think there's a really important sense in which I would 
answer no, because, you know, when I said it's a human ideal, when I said it's what I, it, these people kind of embody what I myself aspire to. What I mean by that is that they are these very like high profile or kind of like very in your face exemplars of what I actually think all of us within our scope and sort of to the extent of our personal kind of like reach and preferences and you know, capacity is better off doing. Namely, making our own choices at kind of exercising our own judgment about whatever it is we do day to day. And this can apply to you know, like when you're waitressing, you know, by day and going to school by night or, or you know, vice versa, or for somebody who like is a a cashier, let's say. You know, so Jeff Bezos talks about how he served, he flipped burgers at, I don't remember where, McDonald's, right, as a teenager. And you could imagine, you know, not knowing someone's going to become a Jeff Bezos or someone who will never be a Jeff Bezos, but actually is just going to be a really competent, really engaged, really thoughtful customer service person at a, you know, at a restaurant. Like there is a way of approaching that work where you're really showing up to it, where you're making choices, where you notice inefficiencies and, you know, silly outdated ways of doing things. And you replace those, you know, with a slightly better way, right? Like you even just you know, set up the environment so that the credit card swiping machine is closer to the customer and the customer doesn't have to, you know, reach over four things and knock things over. And like, you're trying to improve the customer experience, right? And you love your job and you care about it and you show up to it and you think about what you're doing. To me, that is another, that, that is just as legitimate a manifestation of that human ideal as Jeff Bezos you know, founding Amazon, actually. And so I don't actually think, and it's hard in the same ways that it's hard, just again, kind of on a smaller scale, but like there are all kinds of pressures on you to do it the way that your manager has always done it. And you're scared to piss off the manager and maybe they'll fire you. And if you'll, you know, if you get fired, maybe you'll never get another job. And anyway, it's just easier to go with the flow and not rock the boat. And, you know, and it's easier to keep your mouth shut when someone's treating you a little bit badly and to not stand up for yourself and then that becomes a vicious cycle that then leads you to feeling really really constrained and you know kind of disempowered in your personal relationships right like the default is that we struggle with these things and each of us within our scope you know relative to whatever our life projects i believe each of us has the capacity each of us has that inner internal agency to do differently, to think for ourselves, you know, to challenge that status quo. So, so what's the fundamental difference then? Is it, is it, is it courage or the, you know, the desire to act despite the fear? What, what, what's it's a the great question? That... I mean, I think, yeah, I think there's a middle, I think that the mechanism for becoming that kind of person, the mechanism for you know, kind of what differentiates the people who characteristically engage with life in the way I'm talking about and the people who characteristically don't is precisely that it's character. And I don't think that your character is something you can just, you know, snap your fingers and overnight you just become super agential and assertive and, you know, start doing everything your own way and not worrying about what other people think. It doesn't work that way. It's not an easy fix. It's not an overnight deal, which is why, you know, I work with people often for a fairly long stretch of time to really help them to radically better themselves. And there's a whole process to go through in order to do that. But crucially, you can do that. You can change your character. And that's, in a way, that's the currency in which I deal, <laughs> is the currency of character change. All right, so let's unpack that a little bit more. And I've got an idea in my head that I want to test with you. I feel like I'm very spoiled today. I get to test my own hypotheses with a clinical psychologist. This is w wonderful, oh, right? Fine. So, so one of the, one of the things that we we talk about when we talk about things like peer pressure, and you can think about things like the Ash experiment and and the like, mm -hmm. that sometimes, and we think about hierarchy of needs. Uh, I'll I'll use Glass's choice theory as the example here where our need for survival, our need for love and belonging becomes more important than anything else, right? Um, and you spoke about freedom before. People do want freedom of choice and they do want freedom from oppression, but 
a, a superior need is the need for love and belonging and, and the need for survival. And when we talk about peer pressure, we, we then get in these situations where the need for love and belonging becomes greater than the need to be right. And what I'm hearing from you here in this character, this is what I want to test with you, that when you are talking about character and I'm talking about values and beliefs, et cetera, that these people, the ones, you know, you talked about in the shop where they go, oh, this isn't quite right. This doesn't work. Where the need to be right becomes greater than the need for love and belonging kind of the the script flips mm. how, how does that sit with you oh i have i have almost too many thoughts so a great question let me start by pushing back on the framework a little bit because i actually have somewhat of a heterodox view on, on the hierarchy of needs idea first of all maslow didn't quite i mean as often happens there's been sort of some drift and understanding, you know, and in the popularization of the theory. So Maslow, I'm not necessarily knocking on Maslow who originally came up with this concept, um, but that at least as it's understood today, the kind of popular representation of the hierarchy of needs, I think gets some things importantly wrong. Because if you think about this idea that, well, first we need to survive, we need, you know, food and we need a roof over our heads and we need to like be safe. And then we need to be loved, and then we can worry about like pursuing the truth and self-actualizing. How would that work in a context where we don't already have this advanced, sophisticated civilization around us? So imagine if we're on a desert island, or if we're, in, you know, I don't know, hunter-gatherers. Like we're trying to actually figure out, you know, there's no agriculture yet, and like we have a need to survive by finding food. How would we go about that? Would we go about it through just kind of like reflexive kind of, you know, fight or flight based reactive, like, let me grab at the first thing that looks like it might be edible and just shove it in my mouth. Well, that would be a, you know, a path to demise. Like what we would actually have to do is we would have to learn a lot about our environment and think it through and innovate. And, and that's, you know, in fact, there's a long history of innovation that's led to where now you know, in in you know, the kinds of countries, at least where I know you and I live, it's very rare for us to even, you know, like we don't worry about starving, we worry about obesity, right? We worry about eating too much. But that's because people have applied their human ingenuity, their agency, their innovative spirit to solving that problem, motivated by survival, right? Like that's what gives rise to that. I mean, if you think about, you know, the, in the context of COVID, suddenly, you know, there were these memes going around where the hierarchy of needs had been inverted such that Wi-Fi was at the bottom <laughs> and like suddenly, you know, and, or toilet paper, that's what it was. It had been Wi-Fi. Now it was toilet paper and like, you know, and takeout or, or delivery, whatever, right. Where we're suddenly realizing like things that we've taken for granted are suddenly being, you know, taken away from us or rather the normal means of getting our needs met have suddenly been yanked out from under us. And part of what that meant is like, we had to get creative, we had to innovate, we had to, you know, and look at all the innovation that came out of COVID, you know, horrific though, you know, it's been, you know, this awful worldwide pandemic, but like, this is the sort of context out of which human progress and ingenuity springs, right? Like now, you know, just we're talking over Zoom and it's become such a normal everyday occurrence. People, you know, so many people are working remotely. I do most of my therapy and coaching remotely, like it was unheard of, you know, however many years ago that that it would just be so easy but the ways that it, i mean the food delivery kind of industry all instacart has emerged as this major competitor to amazon and it's amazon fresh experiment right where now i i can't remember the last time i went grocery shopping because i had to because now you know there's this new innovative technologically enabled way for me to get my needs met right and so i don't actually think it's true that like creativity, innovation, kind of knowledge pursuit is a luxury that comes after we have met our survival needs. I think there's something really flipped about that idea. I think it's actually through our ingenuity, our independent thinking, our willingness to sometimes challenge the status quo that we get our needs met. And that includes our needs for love and belongingness because the person in the, you know, in Starbucks, McDonald's, whoever, who 
is prioritizing their need for belongingness in the sense that like they want to get along with the manager and be liked by the manager. So they don't mention the fact that they feel threatened every time the manager, you know, makes fun of their outfit or whatever. Like, are they getting real belongingness in that circumstance? I don't think so. I think they're getting a kind of temporary illusion of belongingness in the yeah. sense of like, they don't piss off the manager in the moment, but they're also creating a growing rift between their you know, their full self that has the needs that it has and sees what it sees. And this manager who increasingly is actually, you know, trampling on the, the person's needs and doesn't realize it, right? So I don't actually think that these fundamental needs ever really need conflict. And when they seem to conflict, I think it's because of something we're doing wrong. It's because of some lack of perspective or, or, or some psychological hangup that's mm. sort of keeping us from really seeing the full road and the kind of the, the full picture within which we're trying yeah. to live and thrive. That's really interesting, Jenna. And thank you. I've never had it, had it described like that before. And it's really going to be something that I go away and stop and reflect and, and think upon for sure about the fact that these needs actually in normal everyday life are, are congruent and there's only moments in time where it comes into, into conflict. And I'm, I'm sure we'll see back... conflict. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Uh, and and it's a radical view and I'm happy to, you know, yeah, double down the, on it anytime. It's like that, that perception that, that then drives the way we think about what we're seeing in front of us though, uh, sure. around that conflict. And I, and I think that we'll probably come back to this avoidance of conflict later based on the pre-conversation you and I had. I want to now come back to this innovation and this I think plays strongly into the builder's mindset what I heard from you, Gina, is that necessity driving innovation. So COVID was a great example. And I think the world proved itself to be more resilient than we ever gave it credit for individually and collectively. Yeah. So there's that necessity driving innovation. But what I'm trying to unpack with this builder's mindset, these builders, they're, they're innovating regardless of necessity right mm. so so we might have it interesting in inside us that that when pushed into a corner we're going to innovate and get creative and get ourselves out of the corner but these builders are like everyone else is happy right now and yet they're going no i'm not happy i want something more yeah, I we wanna, can have more. yeah i want to yeah. bring something it could into be existence. better yeah yeah so tell me yeah what's different between that person that innovates despite necessity versus the new, let's say the normal human being that will innovate during necessity? It's a great question. So again, I actually think it's more a difference in degree than a difference in kind, mm. even though it's so dramatic, it might really look like a difference in kind. I think the most ambitious innovators in a way have the widest gaze and the, the farthest gaze in terms of where they see room for the improvement of the human condition which all of this really is about like, you know, I mean, in a sense, you could say, well, there's never been any necessity for, you know, vaccines and all this medical technology and the internet and, you know, people have survived for a little while painfully, but they've survived without all the, these things. So do we need that? Like, do we really need, you know, like, do we need cars and, you know, air conditioning? And I mean, and there's real, like conflict in the world around whether we need these things and whether they're worth the trade-offs with the environment. Right? And to what extent are we just uh, trying to play God when we try to make these innovations, right? Like in what sense do we need them? Well, in the sense that to the extent that we want to live, both literally in the sense of like the longer we want to live, the better our medical knowledge and mm. you know technology needs to be. And clearly that's still a work in progress. Like we can still do better and there are still people innovating in longevity research, right? And then you know, trying to cure cancer and all the different ways that like we, we could be healthier and more resilient as a species and as individuals, right? And that also applies to the quality of life in terms of like, what how, how many choices do we have available to us? How many different ways, you know, like the fact that I routinely coach people, not only on their professional, but their personal lives you know, who are out in the dating world, right? And they're just cursing the dating apps and, oh, it's so hard. And, you know, they don't want to have to get rejected again. And, and 
it's just like, how do I know when I should or shouldn't go on a second date myself? And there are all these people who, you know, and all this swiping. And what they don't realize is the luxury of being able to make all these choices about and being able to meet people who you would never have just met at a bar, but based on like some match algorithm that allows you, you know, to talk to people because you have shared interests, people who are in a different state, people who, you know, are in a different income bracket or whatever, where before, for most of human history, who you mate with was just prescribed for you, right? Like there just wasn't even a question of choosing who to love and who to marry or whether to marry or the configuration in which you want your romantic relationships to, right? The fact that we have all these choices is a massive achievement, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't the default. And so to me, all those things could be seen as part of the necessity that you talk about, you know, that you mentioned where how high we set our sights, like there's no real cap. That's why I talk about raising the ceiling, but there's no limit on how much better and richer and more diverse and more resilient and more interesting human life can get. Certainly we haven't approached any such ceiling or come anywhere close to it. And I think the most ambitious people see that, like they, they set their sights farther. I'm like, dang it, I want to cure cancer. I don't want to just, you know, come up with this one, you know, temporary, uh, like band-aid solution or whatever it may be. Yeah, this is really interesting, Gina. Now, my curiosity is getting away with me so much today. I want to unpack that a little bit more. So this pursuit of better, yes. I love it, first of all. Um, then that pursuit of better is going to show up in a few different ways. And the pictures I was thinking of when you were talking is that pursuit of better might take a materialistic turn and that is not necessarily a path to happiness, by the way, this material, I just want a bigger car. I want a better house, et cetera. And we all, I think it's well documented now that when you get that bigger house, you just want another bigger house, et cetera. It's, it's not mm-hmm. exact, not exactly a pursuit of happiness there. But then when you said, I want to cure cancer, et cetera, the pursuit of better is more about impact. Yeah. So this is, I'm um... Yeah, I'm really glad you're raising this. I'm actually writing a piece on this topic as we speak. So hopefully there'll be a Substack post soon that addresses this more fully. But this is another area where I think we have, uh, we think in a false dichotomy about this whole issue of like pursuing materialistic values, let's say, versus whatever is the other thing, like spiritual, meaningful, what is it? I think there's something you know, I think there's a deep seated and historically old false dichotomy at play where like, what does it mean for someone to just want a bigger house? Why do they want a bigger house? Do they want, because nobody just wants a bigger house for the heck of it. And and certainly nobody wants more money for the heck of it. They want it for something. Maybe it's for what they think it symbolizes. They think, well, if I have a bigger house, then all these people are going to drive by and see my big house. And then I can show off about the big house that I bought to all of these fancy, you know, whatever tech, you know, founders or all of these, you know, hoity toity, like PTO parents who like, or or when I go back for my reunion, I'll show them how cool I am. And it like, yes, it's all just be, it's all hot air. Like none of this is real. It's all trying to affect the illusion of something good in other people's eyes. And I think that's often what's actually being measured by the kinds of studies you're talking about, which find that people who are just like piling on material goods don't end up happier. Because the important question is like, well, why are they doing that? Versus, I think there can be really good reason to want a particular sort of house that happens to be luxurious and large. Like you have a vision for the kind of experience you want your family to have you know growing up like you want your kids to be able to like dash off down the hall and experience the freedom and the you know just like open space of like uh you know whatever open plan whatever you call that you know this is something my husband and I have talked about when we were thinking about whether to buy a house you know or you want to have a big yard so that you can really realize the vision of you know like hosting kid activities or, you know, or having big family gatherings or whatever it is like that it means something to you, or you want it to be a space where you can also sometimes bring the team 
for, you know, like where you really get to curate the environment. I mean, Steve Jobs, I think may come up more than once in this conversation because I, I've been thinking of him and his story a lot lately as I think about the builder's mindset. Like he was very thoughtful, just as he was thoughtful about the design of his products. He was very thoughtful about the design of his spaces, especially sort of later in life when he was married and had kids and like wanted to create a certain kind of bohemian-esque, you know, kind of hippy dippy, but also like spacious experience for his family. Like he wanted his kids to feel like the world is their oyster and to be able to plant stuff in the garden and be, right? Like, is that materialistic? You know, it costs a lot of money. And, and you know, and he had it in mind, I imagine in part as one, one benefit of getting a bigger, uh, you know, profit or getting a bigger return on investment on his products is like, what, what can this buy me? But like, it's not a question of what status is it going to buy me in the eyes of these peers? It's what kind of life will I be able to design for myself and for my loved ones? Where I would frame it a little differently. I think what's happening with the first case it, is it like, is it service of self? Are you serving yourself in the sense of like, you're going to be happier, richer, more fulfilled your life? You know, you're going to drink your life to the least because you got this bigger house that will impress the other moms. But why that's really important is that in the second case, it's not, I would not call it altruism because I actually think it's importantly selfish in the sense that it's your life that you're building. You're not doing it for a bunch of strangers in Africa or wherever it is that everyone now currently believes that you should be donating all your money, right? Like, and maybe there are causes you care about and you donate some of your money to those causes, but like you have the self assertion and sort of like the self confidence, the self love to prioritize your life and like your family and your kids and your community and like the things you care about. And I do think it sort of has to be personal in that way, in a way that I actually think uh, there's a conception of but like selflessness and altruism that I actually think corrodes that where like either, you know, either you're going to be one of these materialists who just wants to impress you know the PTO moms, or you're going to be like mother Teresa, right. Or like, or you're not going to think about yourself at all. Like that's a false dichotomy where there's no room for like a genuine interest in the self as an agent in the world, building an awesome life which I'm all about ultimately. Yeah. <laughs> so I just I, wanted to throw that in there. No, it's really good. And not, and not everything has to be a dichotomy either. Right. So it can be, it can be a spectrum and, and there can be self-fulfilling kind of elements that come into this way that we leave. And we, we know from things like the gratitude study from Seligman, et cetera, that we yeah. know that that's where real fulfillment can actually come from. And you, you know, you could call, uh, you know, all these philanthropists, did they do it for themselves or did they do it for others? And the answer is a bit of both, a bit of both. Yeah. And yeah. And I think there's a way to do things for others that is a hundred percent aligned with, and not just aligned with, but that is actually for you in the sense that these, this is, these are the people you value and mm -hmm. the causes you value. And that means something to you. And these are like, this is a world you want to build for yourself as you're living in it. And your, you know, yourself is an extended self, right? And, you know, like, my kids are part of me, my, you know, the students that I've mentored, the, my clients, they're part of me, like their fates are now wrapped up with mine, right? Like I will be worse off if a client of mine decides to walk off a cliff like, or, or, you know, metaphorically or literally, right? So in that sense, I don't, again, there's no conflict. There's no yeah, trade-off cool. there between All you right. and them. Now, what, I want to circle back to something that you mentioned quite some time ago, but we've, we've been getting quite deep on a, a few other things you said about character change. There's yes. going to be at least some people I'm going to say from more of a fixed mindset approach, but there's going to be some people who say, yeah, but you are who you are. You can't change who you are. What do you mean by character change? Yeah. So this, I have written a Substack piece about and so anyone who wants to get the big, even longer answer, it's called uh, In Defense of Radical Self-Betterment. So I kind of, it's like a whole long you know, piece where I lay out a, a kind of approach, my approach to that kind of character change. But briefly, it's the process of reprogramming ourselves, right? So, you know, we have, I think everyone knows, we have lots of habits that we've internalized, right? We, If we had to 
consciously and effortfully and explicitly rethink and replan every you know moments uh, kind of decision and action, then we would be completely paralyzed. We couldn't walk, we couldn't talk, we couldn't, you know, much less like run a team or a company, right? So, so many of the things that we do day to day are automatized. Uh, they're now just part of our, our code, if you will, right? They're, they're programs that are running on autopilot. And a lot of those formed really early. They, they got programmed when we were maybe three or five, right? Or yeah, or even when we were in our teens or early adulthood, but at a point where like we weren't either fully conscious of or in charge of the inputs and how we process them, right? And so, you know, maybe we ended up with a kind of implicit fear of the by other people and the power that they wield over us and the ways that we are kind of tyrannized by them if we aren't on our best behavior, right? And maybe that's based in real experiences that we had. You know, we all felt relatively helpless to, to some extent in the face of, you know, the parents or teachers or whoever was in positions of authority over us as kids, because that literally was the case. Like we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything without those grown-ups to help us and to you know, support us. And so we've internalized certain models of ourselves, of the world, of what's possible, of what's, you know, worthwhile. You know, I think you had Put it really nicely of like the art of the possible. Mm. Am I remembering that phrase? Yeah. Which I really uh, really resonated with me. Right. Like we have all these implicit programs that go all the way down to sort of core beliefs, like mental models, that then trickle down to the you know kind of the filters through which we see and hear and pay attention and, and sort of remember the things that happen to us. Right. We know about confirmation bias such that you can remember and notice the things that are congruent with your already held assumptions and beliefs and you tend to sort of neglect the things that aren't right and so like anytime someone's a little bit mean to us anytime that you know we try to stick our neck out and then nobody seems to care or pay attention that just reaffirms that aha see i have no real power to affect outcome in social context let's say or you know i if i rock the boat then there will be massive blow back and I won't be able to handle it. It's, it's going to be intolerable. And part of the way we maintain those programs is that we act them out by, let's say, avoiding the confrontations that we're scared of because we think they would be catastrophic, which in turn then leads us to actually have less power in our relationship and, you know, feel more like walked all over because we're not actually telling anybody, you know, what we want or need, or we're not kind of inserting our own input right into the decision making and so that then just reinforces for us that, aha see of course i can't speak up because like look i have no power here you know it's these other people who or you know it's just others or it's the world that's got the agency and not me um and the the road to character change is it, it consists of a, and i put this in a stepwise kind of sequence because there's a logical sequence to it, but of course it's not like clean and linear. Of course it's highly iterative. But if you kind of think logically, like what do you need to do in order to change your program? First, you need to know what it is. And so a huge part of the work is in just like self-awareness, building that self-knowledge, just like noticing, monitoring, observing patterns of feelings, thoughts, behaviors that then point us to underlying, you know, mindsets or assumptions that then we can start to consciously, deliberately and challenge. And part of the work of challenging them is even just in using our current adult knowledge and cognitive you know, ability and sophistication to rethink those old assumptions. Right? Like, wow, so I, like emotionally, I tend to act as if and feel as if I like have no power over this person. Is that true? Or, you know, or, or like, as if this person, it means ill, like as if this person's gonna hurt me. Is that, what's my actual evidence? Like, what do I actually know? Can I bring other information to bear that I'm not, you know, that isn't automatically getting inputted to the program, right? But like, I have conscious agency over what I seek out, right? As kind of corrective evidence. Like, maybe I can 
maybe I can rethink this assumption. Now that's still not going to make the feeling go away. I'm still going to feel really scared and really anxious and threatened and insecure when I go to, you know, give the hard feedback or have the hard conversation with the person. But intellectually, at least, like I'm kind of on board with it not probably being as bad as it feels. And to get over the feeling, I'm actually going to have to go and do it a bunch. Because the only way to ultimately rewire ourselves and change our program is to put ourselves out there emotionally into the very situations that feel scary or dangerous, you know, that are that kind of run against our program and show ourselves, walk ourselves by the hand through those situations to be able to see that they go different, to be able to sort of collect the counter evidence in real time. Right, where, like where we have skin in the game. Like, wow, that was a really awkward and hard conversation. And actually we ended up feeling closer and more aligned at the end of it. That was unexpected. Like now I actually trust them more and they trust me more. And now we're like lighter, you know, like now we're going out for drinks. That was not at all my mental model of how this was gonna go. <laughs> right? And like having a bunch of experiences like that that you accumulate to gradually pull up those programs and replace them with new ones. Yeah, I, I love it. Uh, Gina, what, let me play back what I'm hearing from you. And the power of beliefs is coming through. And whether that's a limiting belief or an empowering belief, right? If it's a limiting belief, it's something that's holding you back. If it's an empowering belief, it might actually drive you in, into action. And about the story that you tell yourself about yourself inside your head. I, I'm the kind of person that, and finish that yeah. sentence, whether it's conscious or subconscious, it's it's there. And are you going to challenge that belief? Is it true? Is that really true? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I really love that. And so am I the kind of person that eats healthy? Or am I the kind of person that, oh, I don't have any willpower. I just, I just indulge myself, right? So all of those things, all the way through to- Yeah, and even like- so sorry, and just to really, and even like, is that even the right question for me to ask? Like, am I a person? Who, well, but do I have to either be that kind of person or this kind of person? Or like, yeah. am I thinking in a black and white way that I'm excluding other possibilities, right? Or I'm like, maybe there's more nuance here. So yeah, so that's part yeah, of the nice. work. But go All ahead. Right. All right. So me. challenging these beliefs. And then what I heard once, once we've challenged the belief and go, hey, is that true? Then I'm hearing a little bit of discomfort. I'm hearing that the change is going to come from stepping out of my comfort zone to try something that might be contra to the original belief, just to experiment, to go, okay, well, I've asked myself, is it true? Now I'm going to try and I'm going to test. Right. So let's talk about that, avoiding the, the, the feedback that you know that you should be giving to one of your team members or even your boss. Let's say. It's uncomfortable. Exactly. Yeah. It's uncomfortable, but you, you tell your story in your head that it's going to go horribly, but then when you do it and it's not as horrible as you thought, well, then you've got a new belief. How does that sit Gradually you? and eventually. Gradually. That, yeah, yeah. No, really well put. Yeah. And it's not going to be an overnight one-time deal, but like it's incremental and you start to notice it usually pretty quickly mm. once you've tried it. Once really, but you know, but there are lots of ways we can sabotage it for ourselves because yeah. remember these programs are you know well rehearsed they go way back they you know they're ingrained and so part of the work is sort of just recognizing and having realistic expectations about like oh yeah like this is gonna take a lot of time it's not gonna be linear i'm gonna regress a lot you know two steps forward one step back and that's all part that's in the nature of what it looks like to change with you know be part of myself right that's all in the nature of psychological change and good for me that i'm persisting through those setbacks right so like yeah that that's sorry you could that's you good go how do we how do we make there. how do we make it a lasting change gina so let, let's keep on using this feedback one and the reason why i keep circling back to this one is this is the leadership project and for all leaders listening to this have a good think about this. We know that giving feedback is one of those limiting beliefs for many, not for everyone. If you're good at this, well done. For a lot of us. Uh, for a, a lot heck of, us, of a lot of us. Yeah, for a lot a of us. A shocking lot of us, yeah. <laughs> including, is... you know, those of us who like supposedly should know better, but like yeah, right, still, right. <laughs> we right, have so this limiting belief. All right. So this yeah. is a li limiting belief for many of us. We avoid conflict. We avoid giving that feedback, even though we actually, most of us are 
appreciate getting the feedback ourselves because once you get the feedback, you can do something about it. There's something that stops us, right? So what I want to talk about now is lasting change. So let me use the same analogy or the same example for that. So let's say that someone does that. They've got that limiting belief about giving feedback. It, something is holding them back. They do what you just said. They challenge, is that belief really true? And they tell, they ask themselves the question enough so that they will act. They'll go out of their comfort zone. They'll have the courage to go and give the feedback. They give the feedback and it goes much better than they ever expected. And their life goes on. But then three months from now, they're back to, oh, right, right. oh I hate yeah. giving feedback. How do we make yeah. it a lasting change? Yeah. I mean, like some of this parallels any other habit change that we might undertake. And I feel like everybody's experienced some form of it. Like you build an exercise routine and then there's, you know, a big life change or you get sick for a while and whoops, like you're off the wagon. And then, you know, and like it takes two weeks supposedly give or take for like a typical kind of like physical habit to catch on. And then it, it takes no time at all for it to kind of slide, you know, slip and slide. And, and then if you've been at it for a year, then it's going to you know, take a bit more for it to backslide and it's going to take less time for you to get back on the wagon. And if you're, you've been at it for five years, you know, so some of it I think really is, just, yeah, like it takes time to program ourselves and the default is that we're going to backslide. So plan for that and stay vigilant through it or have periodic checks for yourself knowing, oh yeah, so I probably don't need the daily journaling anymore that I needed at the beginning to make this into a habit, but I probably could still use like a weekly journal Mm. right because otherwise i'm gonna forget and i'm gonna fall off you know or when when things get really tough or when i'm exhausted because i'm doing the fundraise and i'm sort of worn thin and don't have my kind of you know uh, my full mental resources on hand like i'm just gonna backslide into avoiding and i won't even realize it's happening until it's already you know festered and so let me have my periodic check-ins with myself or better yet maybe check-ins with a coach or with a partner or with a friend, or, right? Like someone who can help keep me accountable. And mm. maybe we're keeping each other accountable because there are ways that each of us is trying to get home, right? Mm. So that's one thing. It's just like knowing it's going to be hard and you'll forget and being realistic with yourself about how often do you need those external prompts that you put into place because you're the one designing your environment to serve you and your desired change. So how do you want to design your environment so that it pings you periodically, so that it sets you up for success, for continued success? Mm. So that's one thing. That's just like super general. That's for any habit that you're trying to change. And these are, you know, a, a type of habit that you're changing. And I mean, another thing which I wanted to say earlier, and it also applies to this question of maintenance, is that it's very natural for us to assume that we have to be able to feel it in order to do it. Like this is a very common, it's, it's sort of, even like the idea of fake it till you make it. It's like, pretend you don't feel anxious and uncertain until actually you don't. And I actually think there's something wrong with that way of thinking because it implies that you can't feel anxious and do it anyway, which is a problem because that's the whole technology of pain you've got to be able to feel anxious and do it anyway you've got to do it when you don't feel like it yet because that's what's going to teach you later to feel like it. <laughs> but like we talked about like you've got to be able to go have the conversation when you feel really anxious and you've got the knots in your stomach and it's awkward and you lost sleep at night just like free ruminating on the conversation and how horribly it's going to go even in spite of all your you know tools like, and you still go and do it. That's the way to change. And then you keep doing that. And so I think getting comfortable with discomfort is one of the key kind of fundamental underlying resilience factors for being able to sustain the kind of changes. Like that's the meta habit. It's one of the meta habits that you want to mm. constantly be attending to and strengthening so that then all the particular habits don't backslide the moment that it's a little bit uncomfortable, right? Like the moment that those feelings creep back in, which they will, because they're pretty hardwired in us by the time we're adults of mm. like, oh, shoot, I'm really scared to have this conversation again. Like, that's okay. As long as you know, you can still go have it, basically. 
Yeah, I really like it, Jenna. And some of the things that are popping into my head, uh, the last bit there, having some really realistic expectations of what success is going to look like. And if you had a different perception of what success was going to look like, you might get disappointed when, oh, okay, it never got comfortable. I need to be able to live with the idea that being comfortable with being uncomfortable so I can act in the face of the discomfort regardless. I think that's a really good one for us to learn, particularly around that feedback part. It might never come natural to you, but the results are worth it. Fully. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. and it will incrementally get more natural to you, which I do think is important. Like there is real payoff and it's nonlinear and it's incremental and that's just in the nature of it. And and the other one I'm hearing a, a lot there is about the resilience. All right. So, so the habit building and, you know, you know, there's all those studies around take 66 days on average to build a new habit, et cetera. But what, what people then get into their mind that it has to be perfection every day, but habit building is actually, it's more about what happens when it doesn't go right. What do you do? Do you drop your bundle and go, the diet's a classic one for this one is uh, uh, I'm trying to eat healthy every single day of my life. I have a hamburger one day and then, oh, I've blown my and diet all, now. I'm, what, I'm not, that's I'm called the what well. the hell effect. Yeah, the what yeah. the hell. I'm yeah, I mean, well. that's the, that's, yeah. It's not because someone has a cheeseburger that they end up failing at their goal. It's because when they have the cheeseburger, that's now their excuse to stop trying to fulfill exactly. their goal, right? It's classic. Yeah, we have all yeah. sorts of terms for this, you know, in the behavior change literature, which sounds like you know, you're familiar with. But yeah, I mean, a framework I've, often come back to but I haven't you know, I didn't make this up but I like it it's the lapse versus relapse versus collapse framework which I learned in the context of I was doing like an a obesity intervention behavior change intervention for obesity and it just it's so helpful to be able to distinguish like so a lapse is you know you have a day where you eat a cheeseburger and whatever follow up or if you're trying to you know like, quit smoking or drinking like you have a drink you have a cigarette or maybe you even go a week where you're just you know back to your old habit a relapse is where oh well i had a lapse now i'm off the wagon oh well okay and then you kind of keep going like that for a while and now that you know that now you're like closer to being back to square one so now you've had a relapse a collapse is when you've just really stopped trying forever <laughs> and like the only way for it to become a collapse is when you die, because until that day, you can decide, you know, that you're going to get back on the wagon, right? And try again. So like, don't let a lapse become a relapse and don't let a relapse become a collapse. And just, I really like that kind of framework for it. Yeah. Love it. And I think that you can translate that into your leadership practice, everyone listening to the show. So you're out there trying to build yourself as a leader and become the leader that you wish you always had and the leader that your team deserve. Not everything's going to go to plan every single day. So you need nope. these resilience tools <laughs> to, to, to be able to go, okay, it didn't work today, but I'm going to go again tomorrow. And I, and I don't mean, you know, the definition of insanity, try the same thing over and over again <laughs> and expect a different no. result. It's about resilience and flexibility and adaptability to be able to go, oh, okay, that was interesting. And the awareness and noticing and naming when something, oh, okay, well, that didn't go exactly how I am planned. What am I going to do slightly different next time? Not not just drop drop your bundle and never try again. What am I going to do differently next time to to uh, to try again? How does that sit with you, Jen? Yeah. That's it's great, and it sort of reminds me of like one of my most oft peddled uh, behavior change goals and sort of what I think of as virtues of character actually because it enables so many of the others and it's so essential for powering our own behavior change is what I call self-honesty which is literally what it sounds like being honest with ourselves and striving to be ever more honest with ourselves and that includes things like oh yeah wow I've really been avoiding hard conversations I've been back into you know I've gotten back to my way you're like wow yeah I think they might be right about this one actually kind of being on me that I really dropped the ball or, you know, I've been claiming to myself and everyone around us that like we have product market fit, but uh, actually maybe we kind of don't, you know, like if you're a founder. And for that, 
for us to be able to really attack that as a virtue in its own right and to then like pride ourselves because I think it's really right to pride ourselves on that self-honesty as a virtue realizing like this is necessary this is a necessary prerequisite to any further change that I want to make because if I can't trust myself if I can't sort of trust my mental model to be self-correcting and sort of truth tracking then I have no power to change anything because I'm not even going to admit it, right? And because I don't even know, because I can't even genuinely track my progress. I'm sort of like, you know, I've lost before I've entered the ring. And that's the default because it's really easy to BS ourselves. It's really easy to lie to ourselves in subtle ways that we're barely aware of, you know, especially when it comes to our self-assessment, right? And like, and the mistakes that we might be making, the responsibility we do or don't have. And so to be able to really like, practice and pride ourselves on practicing self-honesty as a virtue in its own right it i think it's a tremendous motivator for then changing a bunch of the particular things that we self-honestly acknowledge aren't there yet yeah like we can have all sorts of faults and problems and still have this solid foundation for loving ourselves enough to be worth changing for you know because at least we're keeping it real and that's a big deal. It's no small thing to be keeping it real with ourselves. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love love this concept of self honesty and and being honest with ourselves about where we're at. So, look, look, Gina, we've we've covered a lot of ground today. I'm going to attempt because there's so much things, so many things that we covered. I'm going to uh, attempt to recap a few of them. So, so we've been talking about this builder's mindset, this this idea that we're going to challenge the status quo, the pursuit for better. But think tapping into what is the real motivation behind why we want to challenge for better. We've talked spoken about character and character change and that it is possible and addressing limiting beliefs uh, to be able to ask yourself the question, is this belief, this ingrained belief that I have, is it really true? Is it really true? And then being able to step into discomfort to test whether it's true and to notice and name what happens so that we can start building these habits about having the resilience to that when things don't go exactly the way that you're expected, that you do try again. You might adapt and change, but you'll try again, not just not just give up at the first hurdle. And about this self-honesty to really check in with ourselves as to go, well, you know, it's still the same question. Is it really true? Is it really true? And the 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 stories that we tell ourselves checking in as to whether we're true and and these are the things that can make lasting habitual changes in our leadership in the work that we do in our relationships have a really good if you need to listen to this episode a few times listen to the things that Gina has been saying and look at yourself in the mirror and and see what there applies to you and what you can put into your own leadership journey all right. So thank you so much, Gina. This has been Beautiful. a wonderful conversation. I've absolutely adored it. I'd love to now go to our, our final four questions. These are the same questions that we ask uh, all of our guests. So first of all, Gina Gorlin, what's the one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? That it was worth holding out for better. Oh, no. It would have saved me a hell of a lot of time and heartache. You know? <laughs> like, I don't need to go on a bunch of crappy dates and, uh, you know, kind of make nice with a bunch of not very interesting, like, lab, uh, you know, like, researchers. I mean, in every domain of my life, like, I could just hold out for better and better would come. Yeah, but, love it. Yeah, All right, fancy. I could say more, but it's probably kind of, you get the oh, I like it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's self-explanatory. I like it. But what's your favorite book? Yeah, so it's The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, which is potentially a big can of worms culturally, and people, have, you know, it has a lot of different uh, connotations for people. But it's very straightforwardly my favorite book. This one's actually an easy one for me. I read it when I was fifteen, and it it, it was the kind of book that's like there's a before and after for me. Like it mm -hmm. changed my whole kind of life trajectory and I mean to put it simply it portrays a literal builder because mm. he's an architect the story of you know, Howard Work is an architect who starts out 
he has just been expelled from college when we first meet him and when the story starts and he's kind of indifferent and he's fine and actually kind of okay with it because he's already moving on to the next step in his career of kind of building his kinds of building his way and upholding his vision and the whole story is one of like believing along with a major character in the story not to spoil it for those who haven't read it but like kind of believing he's doomed to fail and being completely mystified as to why he still perseveres and then ultimately seeing by the inexorable logic of the, the book like yeah of course he wins of course he makes it because his way works and like the rest of my life is different because of that like i don't have to give up on my integrity very, have belongingness for example. very uh very congruent with everything you shared with us today or uh, thanks uh, yeah. uh, gina what's your favorite quote pretty much this one's much harder because it definitely changes day to day each week but i will have to go with it so there are two steve jobs quotes that i'm so are like battling in my head for current favorite status but I, yeah i'm gonna go with the one that i think it captures more of the essence of it for me you may have run into it before it's the one where he was doing some interview some liberal arts college and again was asked to kind of sum up his own like philosophy of life or you know or, or something like the question you asked about what does he wish he knew and it, he says everything around you that you call life was made up by people who are no smarter than you, you know, and you can change it you can shape it you can make something that people want to use like you can rewrite the history you can rewrite the future and once you realize this then nothing will ever be the same love it it's a little bit of a paraphrase but i think they got most yeah. of it yeah well done yeah All right. like and and finally, Gina, there's going to be people listening to this episode that have been completely enthralled about this concept, you know, builders, character change, I, I so. all of these things. <laughs> uh, yeah. how, do people, how do people find you if they'd like to know more about you and your work? Sure. So subscribe to my Substack. You can subscribe for free at builders.ginagorland.com. Then you'll get you know, or, or just, you know, have a read and see if you like it and then you can always subscribe. Um, and then if you want to reach out to me personally, you can do that through my website, which is just ginagorland.com. Or if you're a founder looking for coaching, it's ginagorland.com slash founders. And Brilliant. Gina with an E is weird. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. All right. We, and we'll put the links in the show notes as well, Gina, so people can find it. So thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your, your insights and wisdom. I feel richer for having this conversation and I know that the audience will as well. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This was really a pleasure and I've, I learned a lot too. Mm -hmm.